Hi, I'm Pat Jankowitz, and this is Creative Current. And our guest today is Hilary Scarl. Which one of you is Hilary Scarl? The penalty of being a filmmaker has been set aside on the condition that you identify the director called Hilary Scarl. I'm Hilary. I'm Hilary Scarl. 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 Scarl. Director, producer, writer, you've done a ton of stuff, Hillary. She recently produced a film, No Ordinary Hero, about a deaf superhero. I did. Thanks Tell for having me. me. Thank you for coming. Well, we're just at the end of post-production of No Ordinary Hero, the super deafy movie starring John Mousier with Marley Matlin about uh, the behind-the-scenes look at a fictitious uh, kids TV character Super Deffy, which is based on a character that John created in the deaf community and has been performing live. And his story mirrors a little deaf boy's journey as he looks up to Super Deffy as he watches his TV show. And uh, their stories parallel and the message is what it takes to be a true hero. <laughs> And you had, to add to your degree of difficulty, this is a predominantly deaf crew, right? Uh, the crew, crew. crew was, um, the cast was half deaf, half hearing, mm -hmm. and the crew was, um, I would say, two-thirds hearing and a third deaf with um, many, many deaf interns who came along. Wow. So we were um, with two languages, English and American Sign Language, through production. And you, not many people know, but you know American Sign Language. Yes, I know. American Sign Language, <laughs> wow. 22 years. Wow. And what, what made you learn that? It was an interesting field of study, or was there a relative? I got involved through deaf theater. I um, was living in New York at the time, and I had done every sort of theater you can imagine. Um, I had seen uh, everything from Shakespeare, Chekhov, experimental theater, kabuki. And the first time I saw a production at New York Deaf Theater, it blew my mind because it involves um, deaf actors who are actually performing um, just like uh, hearing actors are, but they have voicing actors off stage, and it works together like animation, where you've got picture and sound that work as a team together, but are two separate entities. And so it was the most amazing art form I'd ever seen, and a production that changed my life. And I went on to audition for the National Theater of the Deaf, and ended up on a tour bus uh, with 17 deaf actors for an entire year touring with the production of an Italian straw hat. And that was the year that changed my life. Wow, interesting. And uh, um, when you did this, where are you from originally? Tell us that. I am the girl from nowhere. I have moved 30 some odd times in my life. I consider myself mostly from Chicago, New York, Atlanta, and now LA. Wow. So. And um, you, again, you've done a little bit of everything. Anyone looking at your IMDb, you're full of stuff. <laughs> oh. Full of necessity to, <laughs> to get the job done. Well, you did some impressive shorts. You did uh, Snips and Snails, which I think is brilliant. Thank uh, you. And so uh, set, us, set it up because we're going to run a couple of cups around. Oh, gosh, it's been a few years. But um, Snips and Snails is about a little boy who goes to an all-girl princess birthday party, and we shot the whole thing like a horror film. <laughs> Yeah, it's genius. Thank There's you. a you have a long shot in the court. The little boy is going down the corridor, and it's like a David Cronenberg movie. You know, it, and he doesn't know the little boy does not know it's going to be an all girl party until he gets there. And when he's there, once he's there, he's trapped, and and uh, uh, and he's just miserable. It's it's an interesting. It shows the the degree of comfort and discomfort you have in <laughs> someone else's. You know what I mean. Fun thing about it, it was the first first short film I had done um, on a professional level. And by professional, I mean it was a bunch of friends and 
Um, a lot of favors to shoot the entire thing, I think, in two days. Maybe one, I think it was one or two days. And it was a lot of happy accidents that happened because we ended up, um, unbeknownst to the time during production, but we ended up being a little cult favorite on the Gay and Lesbian Film Festival circuit because we were told, oh, obviously you're identifying with the outcasts and a lot of, you know, we had, um, I think our editor was gay and said, you know, um, no, I'm sorry, it was one of our, one of our crew members and said, this is the reason I'm gay because I, I was this terrified of girls when I was a child. And it was a joke and we didn't really think of it seriously until we started getting into a lot of gay and lesbian film festivals and realized, wow. yeah, and somebody wanted to um, use the film as gay studies and we just thought it was a funny premise. And so there's a lot of people read a lot of things into the psychology behind it. Like at one point, um, uh, the little boy throws a toy onto a bed and it's isolated and um, people were drawing parallels and what we meant by it and it's, you know. And you did Ditto. Ditto is also very charming. Kathy has my cup. Ditto is uh, uh, this poor girl <laughs> trying to appease an angry, <laughs> boisterous boss you who keeps screaming for Ditto. No, uh, it was, um, we did the film in five days and I was given the premise to do this um, for um, a TV show and was the log line I was given for the film is something important gets lost. Mm -hmm. And I brainstormed, 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 and I actually worked for a boss where my first day of work, I went into the kitchen and they were giving me a tour and saying, uh, help yourself, anything you want. Oh, except don't use the ditto cup. And it was a big cup that said ditto on it. And I was like, what's the ditto cup? Nobody knows, wow. and it was. It became like this joke for people, like Rosebud, and I thought, and I remembered that conversation, and I turned that into a short, based on the real life um, situation of. I, I guess I should say because he's kind of proud of it. The cup belonged to. Um, it's he's an uh, entertainment attorney by the name of Jerry Edelstein, mm -hmm. who represents like Bon Jovi, Bette Midler, yeah. Dolly Parton, and he has the Ditto Cup, and I actually went and asked his permission to borrow the real Ditto Cup Did for the, no? oh, he was on, he said, I have the strangest life, which is true. <laughs> <laughs> but we did make a stunt cup, because at one point it has to get thrown, and he said, I will kill you if anything <laughs> happens to the and Ditto there, Cup. And there, there wasn't an implied threat, there was a direct murder. Oh, it was a real, yeah, he, he, he was a tough New Yorker, so. Wow. Yeah. And the, the cup made it through unscathed? It made it through unscathed, and I delivered it back, and uh, his, his um, partners were very amused because they knew the story of the Ditto Cup. So. Was, it, was, it, was the story you told the real story? Where you no, I didn't find out the real story until after words after I returned the cup and they said it's because he's such a hardened New Yorker he wasn't able to um, he had a new girlfriend at one point who said I kept saying I love you I love you and he couldn't say it back so all he could muster was ditto uh, and <laughs> she kind of got tired of it so she sent she made him a ditto cup uh, and she obviously saw the film ghost as well <laughs> <laughs> no comment. I don't. Oh. Know. <laughs> <laughs> Your boss was a plagiarist. No. Uh, <laughs> no. The, this leads to another interesting. Hillary Scarl wound up being chosen for the Steven Spielberg reality show The Lot as one of the directors. Was Snips and Snails the one that got you the gig? Snips and Snails was Not what surprised. got me in. Uh, mm -hmm. There were twelve thousand directors who submitted, and uh, I was happened to be at a networking event where the casting director stood on a chair and said, we're looking for submissions for the new um, Steven Spielberg, Mark Burnett show on the lot, mm -hmm. and we're looking for short films. And I had it in the car, so I ran out, got it, and said, you know, here you go, you know, with well, no. no hopes. I mean, I, I had done, um, I was a segment producer on the other side, so I, I want to had, talk about that too. had worked um, as a a producer on reality shows but behind the camera so used to interviewing subjects and thinking up scenarios of them to do so it was really interested then when I got chosen to be on the show because then I drove myself crazy trying to think of anticipating what are they gonna make us do because you know Burnett likes the element of surprise so and did you like Burnett he was great. He was really, really, he is a sharp producer. I, I, I have so much respect for him in his cruel, cruel ways. He works uh, <laughs> a lot on sleep deprivation, which oh, I, was, really? I was prepared for. Uh -huh. I mean, um, you're emotionally, psychologically, and mentally stressed out. So uh, 
crying is good for television always, screaming mm -hmm. match. So being aware of all this, I got to actually kind of chill into my um, persona a little bit, I guess. Nice. And just the... try to focus on getting the work done. Yeah. Wow. And, and uh, did you get a, a bounce from that? Or was it weird that suddenly people on the street are talking to you like, you know? Well, I mean, I got, I wouldn't even say 15. I got like 12 minutes of fame off of that in 2007, which was nice. The best, the two good things the show did for me was I got a first look deal with DreamWorks after the show. And that was good. That opened up some doors. And second of all, it gave me credibility as a filmmaker. Um, I'd only done a handful of short films before then. I did a whole bunch more on the show and for the show. But all of a sudden, I had some street cred to get my first feature done after I got off of the show. And that was See What I'm Saying? See What I'm Saying, the Deaf Entertainers documentary. See What I'm Saying, the Deaf Entertainers documentary, Hillary's film follows four performers. Well, I'll let you set it up. You know what I mean? I mean, tell us about that. It's interesting. See What I'm Saying follows four deaf entertainers, a comic, actor, drummer, and a singer, and it follows them throughout a year of their life. Wow. And what's interesting about the film, as you watch it, is you, you start, you fall in love with all four of them. You know, you root for all four of them. And then what I thought was interesting is, um, sometimes they, they have friction between themselves, and you're, you're, you know what I mean? I mean, well, I think if you follow any artist for a year with a camera, I mean, it's, it's tough. It's tough enough being an artist trying to make it, but you add on the layer the fact that you're deaf on top of it, mm -hmm. it adds an extra challenge. Um, and people at highs and lows, but what I found when we were testing the film um, was that. <laughs> People had their favorite person where, and it was pretty equally divided. Uh, it's, I always said it, not to liken it, but to the Beatles where <laughs> everyone has their favorite Beatle and they're so sure that their Beatle is the, um, you know, and they've got personal reasons. And it's, it's all because all four of the entertainers had their own struggles. So people usually identified with the artist that mirrored their own, because each four were so different. Interesting, interesting. That's very astute, by the way. Did you love all four when you were doing it, or would you have favorites? I had moments, you know, where you're, you're trying really hard to be neutral, and it was tough because they were friends of mine. And uh, I was certainly, I had toured with Robert DeMeo, who is the deaf actor with the National Theater of the Deaf, and we were very close from the beginning, and he was probably the first impetus, the muse, to get the documentary started. And then when I moved to Los Angeles in 1997, I met C.J. Jones, the comic, and he is extremely well known, and he is tons of fun, and just like an onion, the more layers you peel away, it's, it just got deeper and deeper and deeper in, into, you know, just being human. So I found that to be really interesting. So there'd be some days where people, you know, you get to see the good, the bad, the ugly, and just, I think, I try to approach it with a sense of compassion of, you know, we all have our bad days, we all have our flaws, and certainly our warts. And my job was, you know, to tell the story without being exploitive, so. Well, and I got to ask, when you were doing that, when the through line of the documentary is interesting because you have Marley Matlin, there's Liv Frigno, you, you, have, you show other deaf celebrities at the end. But when you were going through everybody's struggle, it's so interesting because you, once you pick, once she takes you into the life of each person, they become your new favorite character. And then, and then again, I, I like the way they were all working towards and away from each other. It doesn't make sense? Well, the stories that are twined because the deaf community is small and um, deaf performers perform oftentimes with other deaf performers. So their stories very naturally and organically um, would interlap, uh, overlap, inter I'm doing the sign, I'm trying to think of the English. Do this, the fishtail. Oh, yeah. <laughs> so it was uh, dovetail, that's dovetail. it. Yeah, <laughs> it's, it's interesting when, my, when I'm signing a lot, my English goes out the window, and when I uh, don't sign for a while, my sign goes out the window. So I've been signing a lot this Yeah, fishtail week. is like a car crash. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> you don't want a fishtail, yeah. that's bad. Fishtail bag, dovetail good. And, and yeah. working in uh, No Ordinary Hero, were you, were you excited the, um, the Super Duffy movie? No Ordinary Hero, the Super Duffy movie, yes. Was it, was it exciting? I mean, you were, you were literally, from start to finish, it was a very... Fast. Yes. It's very fast. Um, I was hired in February 2013, um, and they had um, 
an organization called Deaf Nation who was behind the film to um, wanting to get it out. They had full funding for the film, but no script. They had a character, the super deaf character. Right. And um, so we hired a writer, which um, Tali Ravid, I hope I said her name right. Um, and she wrote the script in about a week, which was unbelievable. But she's a ghost writer for a lot of celebrities in Hollywood. So she, she can, she's used to turning out really, wow. really strong, um, st structured scripts in a short period of time. We shot the entire thing um, 13 days through SAG, ultra low budget film. We edited like um, in a couple of weeks and then posted. And it's actually a really good movie. And you know, you, at the end of it, you're just, you're, you know, you're just crawling across the finish line. Right, and right. Not quite sure what you have, but it looks like even now at the early stages, we've got some bites from distributors and some interest. And um, I think we've got a pretty good film on our hands. So Hillary, what does your job as a producer entail? <laughs> uh, for No Ordinary Hero, I had a producing partner, Doug Matica, and our job was to get from the starting line to the finish line. Uh, the, the film was directed by Troy, Troy Coetzer, who was also here on Creative Current. He was. Thank you for playing. <laughs> uh, he's a fantastic actor who's with, um, with Deaf West, and he's been doing some directing, and this is his first feature film that he's directed. And he's a really terrific visionary and came along, and we had a fantastic crew um, to support that. So it's getting all the pre-production, all the crew, um, the casting sessions, Paul Weber from MGM was our casting director, came along. We have a really great cast. Shoshana Stern from Jericho and Weeds uh, appears as herself. Wow. Marley Matlin, the Academy Award winning actress from Children of a Lesser God. It's so funny that people now, um, mm -hmm. they're like, who? And I'm like, oh yeah, she was on Dancing with the Stars. Like, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Seinfeld. Seinfeld, <laughs> right, right. Or um, The Apprentice. Um, Kim Porter from Decoys. And Dawn of the Dead. Your favorite, yes, yeah, she's Kim. Great. Kim, yeah. she has she plays the bitchy uh, publicist, which is great. A bitchy publicist. Bitchly, bitchy, pub, <laughs> if I can say it, bitchy publicist. Yes. Oh, nice. Uh, Michelle Nunes plays the love interest. And she does a great, great job. And uh, we found a young deaf actor, Zane Henker, who plays Jacob. Um, who does a fantastic job, and I think he steals the movie. And of course, John Mousier, who plays um, himself as, as the role of Tony and Super Deffy. And you have the teacher from The Amazing Spider-Man in it as well. Barbara Lee Harris, mm -hmm. yes, she plays the principal, Principal Gwen, and she does a great job. What's the craziest, and since you came to Los Angeles, what's the craziest job you've ever had in town? I think I know what you're leading up oh, to. Oh, damn right I am. <laughs> um, I was uh, working, one of my first job, I think it was my first job in Los Angeles, was an assistant to producer. And uh, we were working uh, with Wes Craven at the time, and he was producing Wishmaster. The original Wishmaster the on sci-fi probably as we're talking, <laughs> every 10 minutes. And I begged and pleaded and said, please give me a shot. I Just something, because I knew the special, KMB was doing the special effects. KMB is awesome. Greg Nicotero is a genius. Fantastic. Mm -hmm. And I said, I've got to got to work me in there. So uh, they gave me the role of the screaming tree. Bravo. Thank you. She, the Wishmaster, turns you into a tree. I'm on screen for, I think, five seconds. It's a great appearance, It's though. a great five seconds. And Hillary has a screaming tree. How long did your makeup take? Um, it actually took a couple hours, which was, it was the first time I ever had effects makeup, and I had branches that were um, coming out of my face <laughs> and such, and it was it was a really good experience. And I was <laughs> I was really lucky. They had um, uh, the the photo you see is um, was taken by Dale Robinette, who I was actually looking him up today because I haven't seen him in 15 years, and it looks like he's gone on to have great a great great career as a still photographer on many sets. So. Oh yeah. So he took the one shot of me on set of Wishmaster. And as so, a screaming tree, as right there. As a screaming tree. Yes. Do you ever, if you're up at three in the morning and you're flipping the channels in sci fi never. Never? never? You wouldn't stand and watch yourself turn into a screaming tree? <laughs> Who would want to be a screaming tree in a Wes Craven movie? <laughs> it was great. I wanted, I was vying to be the girl shatters in the glass. Yes, yeah. That, that's she a good made it on all the trailers. She, and she was on the, she's on the box. She's on the box. She's on the box. And, and I wanted to be the glass girl, but. 
Oh. Alas, I got to be the screaming tree. But you met Andrew Divoff. The, the, the Wishmaster is played by a great character actor, Andrew Divoff. He stars in low-budget movies, and then uh, he'll be like a henchman attacking Harrison Ford in the Air Force One in bigger budget. But he's, he's this wonderful voice at a garbage disposal. Did you meet him when you were? Oh yeah, we were, we, it was yeah. I actually worked with him more as an assistant capacity, being able to go. I was shuttling a lot of stuff back and forth between the production office and on set. But it was, it was great. It was a good, good first experience. <laughs> <laughs> Very say. nice. Thank you. And when you hit the film, what do you need to know as a director? When you're doing a short, what is, what is your area of discipline? When you're, you've got a short, you've got a little money, a little time. Tell us about that. I am an actor's director. I love to work with actors, and I'm really lucky that I have a whole bunch of friends who are crazily talented, mm -hmm. who I usually like to cast a little bit outside the box and push people into places that they're not expected. Um, so that's usually called upon as one of my strengths that I love to do. I like to find stories that I want to tell, and I tend to run more towards quirky, dark comedy. Just that's what happens. To, even when I try to do drama, there's comedy that always ekes out hmm. somewhere. So You can see that in your work. I mean, I, I, Snips and Snails was the first thing I saw of yours, and I, I just... <laughs> the whole movie is like a far side cartoon, you know what I mean? I mean, uh, it's just kind of brilliant the way you shot it and the way you did it. And you can, you can look them up as well, guys, if you go to Hillary's official site. And her shorts are amazing. Thank you. Know? you. Mm -hmm. It's, uh, yeah, I like to tell good stories. I like to work with talented people. Mm -hmm. And I like to have fun. And I'm really lucky that I have a bunch of people that I really enjoy working with. We just finished our final sound mix uh, yesterday on No Ordinary Hero with the fabulously talented Joe Milner at Puget Sound. And we were saying at the end of we, you know, we, we laugh and make jokes and it's because our chemistry as, you know, what we are able to do together and play off each other really works well. And to me, even something, he mixed um, uh, See What I'm Saying as well and did the sound design for it. it was quite elaborate job of what he did on both films. And uh, his job is to be invisible, where it doesn't call attention to things, but a thousand, thousand little decisions that go into making the film better. Wow. Yeah. And, uh, and as, a, as a director and a producer, what do you prefer of the two, be honest? I'm a director who is a little bit, <laughs> I don't want to say control freak, but <laughs> I, I like to get my work out there. So it's, um, to be able to produce my own work makes it um, hopefully go before an audience. I think if you um, create something really wonderful and it sits on a shelf, that's fun to do and enjoyable, but I also like sharing my work and um, supporting the people who work with me. So in order to do that, you have to get it out in front of an audience. And I like finding creative ways to get the film out. So that's my producer's hat. So I think they work well in together but def i i like the artistry of both but wow interesting but oh, directing yeah, yeah. <laughs> sure but directing's your thing you love directing's, directing. my, directing's my thing but it's it's interesting i just joined the alliance of women directors uh -huh. and it's interesting that uh there's still a stigma about hiring directors who happen to be women and i always said i'm not gonna play the woman card it's like people get hired because they're talented and Yet I do notice that I, I do have to work twice as hard to, um, to get hired for jobs that, you know, I see some of my male colleagues who, you know, are a little bit newer to the game or, um, uh, it, you know, and I don't want to, I don't want to play that card, but at the same time, it's a, it's a real challenge in the industry. And uh, so it, it is, in order to get to continue working, I guess you, to say I, found that producing is helpful so I can continue to employ myself. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, you know what you're getting. You, you're representing yourself is probably, you know, hiring yourself for a gig is, is smart, actually. Thank you. Well, you want to work. You want to get your work out there and you find a good story that you want to get behind. Um, I definitely like the creative side of it. I like um, working with the writer to um, get to the place where we all have one unified vision and then you know, where everyone's confident enough when we're on set that 
happy accidents can happen or if there's delays uh, that everyone is in sync enough that we can all say, you know, we're going to drop this and do this now or just to be flexible. Wow. And, and, uh, and Alliance of Women Directors, it sounds like Justice League or something. So <laughs> Catherine Bigelow said hello at the next meeting. I, I, <laughs> I don't think she needs to come. <laughs> I think she's pretty, she's good. <laughs> Once, uh, when you mentioned dark comedies, are, is there anything you got your eye on? Or you, uh, uh, no, no, what I was going to ask is, uh, short-wise, when you do a short, do you prefer generating the material yourself? or? doesn't matter. I mean, I, if where the idea comes from, I enjoy writing, but I don't like to put a shingle out saying I'm a writer. And so whether it comes from me or somebody else, um, I like getting behind a good idea. Um, I have less ego attached to my own material, I suppose more flexible as I have a lot of respect for the craft and people who do it full time and it's, it's, I really, really value working with talented writers. Um, I'm sorry, what was the question? <laughs> no, you answered it perfectly. You know, I, I was thinking about Hank and Larry. I liked your script, Hank and Larry. Oh, thank you. Mm -hmm. Hank and Larry is my buddy road trip comedy about uh, the head gardener for Rockefeller Center who goes on a desperate mission to find the world's largest Christmas tree that's owned by a deaf um, man named Larry and he must convince him to give up his prized spruce in exchange for his first road trip to New York City. That's a good pitch. That, that sounds thank good. You. Yeah, thank that makes you. Sense. So I wrote it for specific actors and I had a Kickstarter event to fly out um, seven actors to Los Angeles last January 2013 and just to see how it read out loud especially since I have a cast of deaf and hearing actors and uh, we ended up getting 200 people to show up to this workshop. Okay, so the Wishmaster Company, you're working for a low-budget producer. Did you learn a lot there? I mean, uh, it's like the Corman School where you have to get your feet wet because everything you're working on has to make money. I did. I was working for Image Organization, which was owned by Pierre David, and mm -hmm. I was assisting Clark Peterson, who went on to do Monster. But I, it was my first job in Los Angeles. Wow. And because it was such a small company, I got to sit in on all the, all the development meetings. Amazing. Um, got to see how a script went through from coverage to development to pre-production, casting, production, post, get to hang out with the editors, um, screen dailies, and, you know, made friends at Photocam. So it was, <laughs> it was nice to be able, that was my introduction to L.A. as I was trying to decipher my way around town and really see the ins and outs and go to market at the very end. And so it was nice, you know. Oh, you went to AFM? We did. I mean, I, you know, got to walk around, collect magazines, and um, deliver notes to my boss, and then go back to the office. You so went to the, but you went to the Honest to God American Film Market. The Honest to God American Film Market. Tell us about that, because it's, the, it's an annual event where it's the, the crazy, the Tromas, the Cormans, all the low-budget companies come out. And the, it's the only place where Toxic Avenger is the George Clooney of this sort of thing. Well, it was a long time ago because I can't afford to go now. But uh, I, it was it was interesting to go in and out of rooms, and every production company is selling their slate and their catalog of their films. Monsters, and, naked chicks. Exactly. And, and the thing about it, it's interesting to really see how the business works. That people come in with their list, and they're like, you know, they need X amount of horror, X amount of dramas, X amount of whatever genre. And it's just like going shopping, and they know they've got to fill their slate before they go back to wherever they came from. So wow, wow. Yeah, and it just it puts a real practical spin on your what you're trying to do. It's and it's not just about art, but it's very much about commerce as well. So did it depress you or impress you to see how the industry worked? You're looking at the bare belly of the machine, basically. I think it's I think it's a necessary thing to understand the machine to then understand that. I don't necessarily want to be a huge part of the machine mm -hmm. or how it can work um, to my advantage that you can f fit yourself in any way you wish as a cog or um, make your own little teeny tiny machine that maybe can't compete or maybe be a new part to the machine. Mm -hmm. So I think there's media changes every day and I like that people are inventive and creative and find new ways to make films and find new ways to get their films out there. Wow, interesting, interesting. And what's next for Hillary Scott? 
I'm taking Hank and Larry, my buddy, road trip comedy out. Uh, I also have another couple scripts that I'm looking into for development for possible directing projects for this fall and spring of 2014. And I've got a couple TV show ideas that yeah. hopefully I'll have some time this fall to develop that there's a little bit of interest in. So. Knock on wood, that's impressive. And, uh, and No Ordinary Hero 2, of course. Of course. Uh, yes. <laughs> Your poster is beautiful, by the way. Thank if you. If you look at the image, you guys, what a beautiful image. You Marcus know? Alvarez wow. designed that. And he, I'm so, so lucky to have had him design the poster. And I can thank my dog, Charlie, for that. Oh, how did Charlie introduce uh, you to a good Marcus poster? takes his dog, Gizmo, on the same um, uh, path, uh, and it's... It, you know, it's, I, I live in Burbank, and so um, our dogs, people have the same dog walking schedules, <laughs> and you get to chit-chatting as your dogs run around and play or whatever. And so he told me very, um, he, with a lot of humility that he was a poster designer, and I didn't quite understand. No, he is the poster he designer. Is, he did the Dark Knight, the, the famous Dark Knight poster of the Joker with, the, with the, the mouth written on the mirror, which said, why so serious? You know, uh, just a brilliant, brilliant poster guy, you know? He's a brilliant designer, yeah. And if you go to superdeppy.com or noordinaryheromovie.com, either one will link to our website and the poster. Hilary Scarl, it's been a pleasure. Thank, Thank you for joining you, us Pat. on Creative Thanks Current. Thanks for having me. Thank you.